15 years. 15 years! You make one Reddit account and they got you for 15 years. So if you're not really familiar with the history of Dig and its relation to Reddit, uh, this is going to be one of the few times where I really beg you to just like watch at the very least the first half of the video where I talk about Dig. While researching this video, some of the parallels I found between the two just... I'm a very disappointed dad right now. So first off, if you clicked on this video, thank you very much for your time. I think that if you care about Reddit or you care about the history of Reddit, this is something that I really think needs to be kind of talked about and uh, extrapolated on and just and just something that I kind of needed to have a little bit of a deeper dive because seeing the state of this website right now sucks and it makes me so frustrated and sad and I would say angry, but it's just only the commenters that make me angry now because there's so much stupid stuff that I never thought that I would see in Reddit. So yeah, as you can tell, this is gonna be a little bit of a hot episode. I'm feeling a little bit hot and not just like temperature wise, but anyways, thank you. So I've been around the internet for a very long time. Um, I've seen a lot of changes. Like I was there for early AOL Instant Messenger, you know, Kazaa, LimeWire, Napster. It's just really crazy to me to see where I started with and now basically it's just all ubiquitous and we're at the state now where TikTok is now the dominating social media. But probably one of the most influential and significant websites in my personal journey and my time on this earth has probably been Reddit. Now to understand where I'm coming from, I'm gonna show you guys like my, my actual main Reddit account. As you can see, I've been a user for 15 years, which is literally almost half my life, 45%. If you can't do the math, I'm 33 years old going on 34. Yes, I know. Thank you. That's a long time to spend on one godforsaken website. So in 15 years of being on the front page of the internet, what have I gained in all that time? Well. I've gained the ability to give them my money and the chance that I would maybe make more money. In my opinion, that's not worth it. I'm not here to get pumped and dumped, at least you know, not like that. So before we dive in, I do want to make one thing completely transparent and clear. My background is in marketing within like tech and gaming, and I'll bring up relevant places as they become relevant. But I will say that I had interviewed with Reddit a couple times Anything that I'm saying and everything I'm saying isn't influenced by that because I'll be quite frank, I had a lot of these opinions before I even interviewed with them. So if anything, I was hoping maybe I'd have a chance to change some things from the inside, but here we are. I know I did this last video, but I'm gonna do this every time I need to and every time I want to. Thank you so much on all the feedback and all the views and all the stuff on the last videos. Over my past couple of videos, I've gained almost 100 subscribers now. I'm getting ever closer to that elusive 500 to start my journey towards partnership. And oh my God, I cannot thank you guys enough. I love this so much. I love you all. And the thought about this actually being something somewhat feasible is insane. So if you want to help drive me insane. So once again, thank you, thank you, thank you. If you haven't seen my Hell Divers video or my Black History of Rock video, I'll they're, they'll be here somewhere. Anyways, on with the video. So as you can probably tell by the title and the thumbnail and everything in this video, I'm not really happy with the state of Reddit. Literally the two things that, well, the three things that keep me using it is Reddit Enhancement Suite, which if you're not using that, go download it right now. Old.reddit.com, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's the old version of Reddit, the one that I at least, you know, grew up with. And on top of that, third party applications. Shout out to Relay. If you, you know, I know people like to use Reddit as fun and Apollo and all that, but as an Android user, I like Relay because to me, it best mimics the old Reddit experience. So right off the bat, Go support all those things because the second that old Reddit and Reddit enhancement suite stops working, I'm done with desktop. And if for some reason I can't afford paying for Relay or they find a way to completely kill that too, I'll be done with Reddit as a whole. That's where I'm at. 
So while those aforementioned tools provide some relief, the platform's recent changes like the terrible and clunky UI and unnecessary features such as chat rooms and live stream channels and all that stuff, it's left a bad taste in my mouth. And don't get me started on the very slow but quick death of third party apps because I'm gonna get there late. Now with Reddit's IPO live and out in the wild, the idea of offering shares to regular Redditors, much less the general public, I cannot help but feel a little bit skeptical. The thought of Reddit once a kind of a grassroots platform getting mixed up with Wall Street of all places when, you know, they were a big part of Occupy Wall Street, it just, feels like a little bit of a betrayal on philosophy of some of the founders of the website. And yet, despite the blatant hypocrisy in philosophy and the degrading quality of the website, people still act like it is just some sort of intellectual bastion of civility and higher thought and all this other stuff when I continuously see some of the dumbest stuff that I have ever seen on Line, including places like Twitter. <laughs> like, I can't believe I'm saying this, but back in my day when people acted like being a Redditor was something to, I guess, be impressed with, it was because of the fact that one of the top subreddits of the entire website was r slash programming, not whatever the hell we have now. <laughs> And especially in all this moral and intellectual superiority, they go and defend the dumbest stuff. Like I recently had this conversation with somebody that was trying to defend microtransactions in games like Diablo 4 and World of Warcraft. And essentially the way that they summed it up before they stopped replying it to me was, hey, I used to work in games journalism and I can go back anytime that I want, but me doing other stuff pays more and I'm sitting here like okay so you're admitting that you're just a shill for money and for some reason your stuff wasn't good enough to warrant even you being a shill like I'm I'm losing my mind here being on this website and especially with all the you know the TikTok ban stuff going on that's actually what prompted me to make this video the discourse that i've seen from redditors acting like that their website isn't completely immune from things like astroturfing paid influencers and complete disinformation like it tells me that they weren't there for 2008 2012 maybe they were there for 2016 but they missed out on stuff like Unidan and the Jackdaws and all sorts of other dumb stuff that I have seen in my 15 years of being on the website. Can you tell that I am really heated about this? Like the reason I feel like I'm losing my mind and taking crazy pills is because this is the exact same reason that Dig fell. And for those who don't know, strap in kids because old man is about to yell at the digital cloud. It's time for a history lesson. So dig.com was the brainchild of a couple tech bros, tech entrepreneurs named Kevin Rose, Jay Adelson, Owen Byron, and Ron Gorodzetsky. <laughs> but they emerged on the scene starting in November of 2004. Dig was offering a platform where users could submit links and vote on stories, which I, wow, that sounds very familiar, doesn't it? But Dig quickly became a really popular website for things like news aggregation and really helped kickstart the idea of a website where a lot of different news sources are brought into one centralized location. Kevin Rose threw down an initial investment of six grand, which he meant to keep for a down payment on a house and use that to kickstart the platform, which launched December 5th of 2000, completely free of advertisements, might I add. Unlike other sites that were focusing on bookmarking like StumbleUpon and Pinterest and things of that nature, Dig aimed to curate news stories catering to dynamic content rather than static sites. 
I think you can see where I'm going with this. However, by 2009, Kevin Rose had hinted at the need of Dig to evolve into a more real-time platform, starting to echo the rise of things like Twitter and Facebook's response to Twitter with its live news feed. This led to murmurs of a major overhaul for the website itself, which was expected to roll out within six months of the initial announcement, but faced delays pushing it to about late April of 2010. The long-awaited Dig version 4 debuted on August 25th of 2010, with Rose personally announcing its arrival. However, the launch was marred by technical glitches, including downtimes, increased latency issues, and just errors connecting your Dig account to Facebook. Despite the hiccups, Mashable CEO Pete Cashmore voiced support for the update, highlighting its potential to attract publishers and drive traffic to Dig. Through his weekly column on CNN, Pete spoke in favor of this new version of Dig and declared that it might be a winner. Furthermore, he said that it's in the company's best interest to cater to this new group. And by group, I mean the aforementioned publishers that were driving traffic to Dig because they are able to generate significant traffic for Dig by using the site's widgets and buttons. So think about like when you see an article and there's like a Facebook share button or something along those lines, a Reddit share button that you may be more familiar with. Dig was one of the people that helped popularize that. Yet the response from the users of Dig was obviously less than enthusiastic. A poll conducted by Mashable revealed that a whopping 83.22% preferred the old version of Dig, citing concerns about the platform's shift towards mainstream publishers. Huh. How are users like Muhammad Salim and Andrew Mr. Babyman Scorchini voice similar grievances? They felt sidelined by the changes which included things like a bury button, think of just a downvote button, and having timestamps on submitted links. Rose attempted to address these concerns through his own personal blog, emphasizing that the changes were aimed to help prioritize quality content over popularity. However, people that did further analysis revealed that Dig's front page was basically dominated by a select few publishers, which promoted skepticism about the platform's commitment to empowering the users that made it popular in the first place. You see where I'm going with this? So amidst a growing discontent, Dig faced a mass exodus of users that revolted against the new version. This was me. This is where I came into the picture personally. Users flooded Dig with links automatically submitted by Reddit through things like RSS feeds and on the front page of Reddit itself, which effectively hijacked Dig's front page with Reddit. Reddit not being stupid and realizing the perfect PR opportunity they had on their hands saw a significant influx of new users and traffic from dig.com. In response, Dig briefly disabled content submissions and tweaked its algorithm to improve source diversity. But I mean, by that point, the damage was done. One of Reddit's co-founders, Alexis O'Hannon, penned an open letter to Kevin Rose, criticizing Dig version 4 as a departure from its original ethos of empowering users. He speculated that venture capital meddling had led to the platform's downfall, lamenting the loss of its unique identity. And if you'll indulge me, I'm going to read this entire letter out loud. It's not that long. But I think that hearing it or seeing it, you know, I'll include the link down below. But this letter, reading it and seeing the state of Reddit now, I, mm, mm, I think you can see why I'm very fired up about this video. Kevin, it's been a while since you cleverly debuted Dig on screensavers on that slash dot killer segment. Funded by Y Combinator, Steve Huffman and I started to work on Reddit in June 2005, which we launched a month later. A month after that, we learned about Dig and realized that this was going to be an interesting new space. We had some catching up to do. Remember those great days? It was long before Facebook was confusing people with awkward privacy settings, before Twitter existed, and even predating the social media industry, quote unquote. Back when social media gurus were simply called tools. <laughs> 
You built a remarkably popular website with an adoring fan base most companies can only dream of. Dignation was a brilliant decision that paved the way for Revision 3, which doesn't get half of the press it deserves. In short, you were in the zone. Side note, uh, Reddit, as you can look at their YouTube page, I can definitely tell that they tried to recreate some of that Revision 3 magic, and it did not work well because they had like an AMA with Anthony Weiner of all people, which is hilarious and at the same time, like in Ron Paul too. Like this is what Reddit was like when it first started out. It was people that were standing over Ron Paul and Anthony Weiner. I was one of those people too. Like, I, I don't know how much it needs to be emphasized that I don't understand how I came out like half as adjusted as I am. I spent 15 years on Reddit and I at least have like half the mind to know what, how to live as a person and how to not be a Redditor. <laughs> Once again, I got too hot. All right, back to the letter. And we got lucky, frankly. We sold the Con de Nass in 2006, which stayed hands off, which let the site keep growing. And they even encouraged us to open source. The site has grown to over half a million unique visitors a day. And all of that is run by four awesome sauce. Oh my God. Four awesome sauce developers. Edit and one fantastic community manager, which we will get to. I think the math comes out to one dev for every 2 million monthly uniques. No big deal. Just, you know, a humble little startup. I say this all because the new version of Dig just reeks of VC meddling. It's cobbling together features from more popular sites and departing from the core of Dig itself, which was to give power back to the people. You know, power to the people. Those are your words from an aforementioned 2004 video segment. Now what matters is how many followers and influence a user has and how many followers and influence they've got. Where have we heard this before? Twitter? Facebook? Google Buzz? Which, if, if you... <laughs> Never mind. Kevin, you absolutely deserve all the credit for starting the movement. Fascinating things happen when online communities can effectively share content. Whales get silly names and we can expose the tragedies our fellow man endures faster than ever before. It's a damn shame to see Dig just re-implementing features from other websites. But I've got a strong feeling that it's not you making these decisions anymore. And to see your baby abused like this must be awful. This really should have been called an open letter to Diggs VCs, but what kind of link bait would that be? Oh my god, link, oh my god. Sorry, I'm having PTSD of early internet. Because they really ought to give power back to the founder. All the best, Alexis. And then this is a PS and some little bit of extra context. Although Steve Huffman and I founded reddit.com, we've both since moved on. In case you're curious about what we're doing now, I'm working on Bread Pig and Steve is getting a pilot's license and enjoying married life, but I think he got divorced later. Yeah, by this point, Alexis had already sold Reddit and he was off doing what the hell ever, getting married to Serena Williams, which I mean, like, hey, kudos to him, but, um, Actually, now that I think about it, what is he up to right now? Aaron, no! Yeah, so he's basically just really proud of the fact that he did what Dig wasn't able to do and go public and just get a whole bunch of money and all that, despite the fact that he's doing the exact thing that he is criticizing Kevin Rose of doing. So that is why I'm so hot about this. And you know, if you don't want to hear anything else, at the very least, I thank you for watching this far because I think this was the most important part of the whole video. If you at least like that, click like, share, subscribe. I'm going to make an attempt to post this on Reddit. We'll see if it gets very far. But yeah, I really think that at the very least, this letter is something that more that needs more eyes. If you want to stay for the second half, thank you for that. 
at the very least, if you want to hear what I have to say about the current state of Reddit in regards to the API and the, not the IPA, the API and the IPO, then let's go to the second half now. To follow up on a very weirdly prophetic indictment is Drew Curtis from Fark.com with his take on the whole Dig version 4. I'll include the link down below, but I'm really just going to read two parts of it. Back when we were doing Fark TV, someone emailed in a complaint that I've never forgotten. They said that they didn't like the show because it was a sketch comedy show that had the name Fark stand on top. There wasn't really anything Fark about it. You can't just stick the Fark name in there and expect the Fark community to just adopt it as their own. Whoever sent that in was right. Dig just made the same mistake. They just scrapped their existing site, replaced it with a new one, and told everyone that it was the same. That's what everyone's angry about. It's not Dig. And they really resent being repeatedly told it is. As for the actual Dig version 4 concept, I have no idea if it's genius or stupid. I can't tell. Maybe it's the next Twitter. Maybe it's the next MySpace. Time will tell. And I mean, seriously, replace Dig with Reddit and... So echoing O'Hannon's statements, others noted that Dig's missteps paved the way for Reddit to emerge as the premier news aggregate. This user-friendly, at the time, interface, minimal ads, at the time, and strong community engagement yeah, well, yeah. Reddit filled the void left by Dig's premise, cementing its position as the go-to platform for news aggregation. And I think that's probably the main reason that Reddit does still stand strong right now is because of the fact that there is no already decently populated competitor. I know that there's like Lemmy and the Fediverse and other things of that nature, but until they get enough of the population from Reddit to actually start providing its own exclusive substantial content, people aren't going to be flocking over there yet. It's the same thing with YouTube too. Same thing that there's no YouTube competitor because of the fact that there isn't a large enough user base, let alone a large enough mainstream user base to actually have it be an attractive prospect. Sorry, I just marketing brain. Speaking of marketing brain, the shift in Reddit to a more corporatized mindset and philosophy began with its meteoric rise in its popularity and influence. From the end of about 2010 onwards, following Reddit's transition to uh, AWS servers in November of 2009, the platform witnessed an exponential growth in page views and bandwidth. Because of the fact that the website grew so quickly, People talk about the fact that Reddit doesn't work now. It didn't work back then. A lot more. But by February of 2011, Reddit was already hitting a staggering 1 billion page views per month. But this was the same year as the infamous CNN news story about the then thriving subreddit, Jailbait. To quote Wikipedia, Reddit rose to infamy in October of 2011 when a report by CNN showed that Reddit was harboring the r slash jailbait community, which was devoted to sharing suggestive or revealing photos of underage girls. After commenters were seen asking for those types of photos of underage girls and under significant external scrutiny, Reddit shut down the subreddit. Like, yeah, it took a CNN expose for them to shut down the subreddit because they were trying to pull in Elon Musk and say that they were still a bastion of free speech. Despite the fact that, you know, they obviously wanted to be more corporatized, probably trying to lead up to this IPO. Within just a year by January of 2012, Reddit's page view figure doubled, reaching a jaw-dropping 2 billion page views per month, per month, per month. The momentum didn't stop there. Reddit continued to just absolutely skyrocket, racking up 37 billion page views in 2012, which was followed by 56 billion in 2013. And then 2014, they even went harder by doing 71.25 billion page views. Yes, we have to admit, those are some really impressive numbers. 
During this period of explosive and exponential growth, Yishan Wong held the reins as Reddit CEO from March 2012 till about November 2014, when he was succeeded by Ellen Powell. And if that name is familiar, you already know where I'm going with this. By September of 2014, Reddit has secured a hefty $50 million in funding during a Series B round making a significant milestone in its evolution and one step closer to it being a publicly traded tech company. The platform also made its first app acquisition in October of 2014, which signaled a strategic expansion into the mobile market. It was around this time that I think that Reddit seemed to realize the sheer magnitude of its influence and the indispensability of its offerings. Like I said, there's there's no one else in town offering the same type of thing that Reddit does. This realization laid the groundworks for a shift towards a more corporate approach, setting the stage for all the ludicrous and ridiculous events that would follow. So on June 10th of 2015, Reddit shit hit the Reddit fan. A post signed by Ellen Powell and a couple of other bigwigs came out swinging. They announced the ban of five subreddits accused of stirring up and promoting offsite harassment. One of these subs, r slash fat people hate, boasted a hefty 150,000 strong subscriber base. You can imagine the incel uproar. Outraged Redditors wasted no time. They fired up change.org petitions of all things, demanding Ellen to resign. One of these petitions even racked up a solid 10,000 signatures in just a few days. But I mean, that was just the tip of this stupid iceberg. The hate train just kept chugging along with some users hurling vile comments and images at POW across Reddit and beyond. Most notably, r slash punchable faces where she basically became the mascot. And on top of that, folks were also griping about the site's moderation tools and how apparently some posts criticizing POW's previous legal battles would mysteriously vanish thanks to the administrators and moderators of the site itself. Fast forward to July 2nd and the opposition itself is still going strong. Reddit went into lockdown mode as chunks of the site were all set to private, all in protest of the axing of Victoria Taylor, the talent director famous for her work on the Ask Me Anything interviews, the once famous and now infamous outlet for celebrities and other people to self-promote whatever newest project that they have. The mods over at AMA were not shy about voicing their frustration either. They were miffed about being kept in the dark regarding Taylor's departure. The finger pointing game was in full swing with many blaming Ellen Powell for Taylor's exit, which only added fuel to the fire for the anti-POW groups. The backlash was very intense with POW facing more barrages of harassment than she did previously. Once again, more petitions for her ousting, like Obama was going to come out and say, all right, you need to get out. Get out. That's my Obama impression. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But anyways, one of these petitions surpassed 200,000 signatures. Pow tried to do damage control with apologies on both Reddit and in Time Magazine of all places. But I mean, it seemed like the damage had already been done. She called it quits on July 10th and handed the reins over to Reddit co-founder, now CEO, still reigning CEO, Steve Huffman, also known as Spez. Oh, but before I forget, on July 12th, former CEO Yishan Wong stepped into the ring with a series of very damning posts declassifying some of the insider info about the Reddit execs. And surprise, surprise, it turns out that Taylor wasn't axed by Pow, but by Alexis Ohanan. Pow, and rightfully so, Pow couldn't help but really throw a little bit of shade their way. Tweeting her thanks to those who didn't immediately blame her for Taylor's exit. Wong wasn't done yet though. He went on to slam the movement against POW and warned about stricter policies under the site's original founders. Huffman wasn't about to let this drama really die down either. He rolled out a policy to tone down the visibility of certain xenophobic communities and axed a few others as well. 
But in this hardcore time of like nipping and pruning, I mean, a lot of people at this time saw what was being prepared. So these hits just kept on coming. Reddit's chief engineer, Bethany Blount, jumped ship, citing a lack of support for POW from the board and hinting at the whole glass cliff debacle, something where women get stuck with a whole lot of tough gigs until they're essentially forced to resign or something along those lines or get fired. Pow herself penned an editorial on July 16th talking about the uphill battle against harassment while still trying to keep Reddit's edgy vibe intact. She described it as facing one of the biggest trolling attacks ever, but also highlighted the unexpected surge of support that followed. And in hindsight, oh my god, why? Now let's fast forward to June 2020 and Pow's back in the ring, throwing punches at Reddit's current CEO, Steve Huffman. She took to Twitter to call him out, accusing him of letting racism and hate run rampant on the platform. This was in response to a lot of the reaction of things like George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter movement that soon followed. So as I said, Ellen went to Twitter, called him out of excusing racism on his platform, but not only that, she even claimed that Reddit profited from it and that Reddit was cashing in on white supremacy, which is not wrong. Huffman had released an open letter vowing to crack down on the hate, the racism, and violence, but Powell and many others were not buying. Neither were some of the most popular subreddits like NBA and NFL, who shut down in protest for 24 hours, slamming Huffman's letter as hypocritical and demanding real action against the racism on the website. And yes, they eventually shut down and cleaned up a handful of different subreddits, but did they really crack down on the racism? And now we're about at the timeline where Reddit's API and IPO are starting to come into play. So back in 2008, Reddit introduced its application programming interface or an API. An API grants developers access to a site's corpus of posts and comments, essentially letting them kind of create the functionality, the interface and things like that, but still being able to pull in and aggregate all that data from the original site. This move was very, very important and very, very big. This move opened up a huge world of possibilities for developers who used Reddit's free API to create a multitude of third-party applications and moderation tools, allowing them to enhance the platform's functionality and accessibility. From specialized browsing experiences to innovative moderation solutions, these third-party apps became the preferred way for many users users like myself to engage with Reddit's vast ecosystem. And some would say that part of the reason that Reddit got so popular was because of the user-friendly interfaces of a lot of these third-party apps. Like I said, shout out to Relay, but you know, leave your favorite Reddit app in the comments below, especially if they're still up and running. Give those people their money, they deserve it. However, Reddit decided to overhaul its API and introduce paid access that marked a very significant turning point. However, once Reddit decided to announce that it was going to overhaul its API system and introduce paid access, it marked a very significant turning point that really kind of solidified the whole us versus you future of Reddit. Suddenly developers found themselves having to pay substantial fees in order to use this API and this in turn forced them to consider the viability of their projects. The implications were pretty freaking dire particularly for apps like Apollo, which is probably one of the most popular third-party Reddit clients for Mac and iPhone. The developer behind Apollo highlighted the staggering costs associated with Reddit's new API pricing, rendering the app financially unsustainable. The repercussions of Reddit's API changes reverberated across the developer community, with several apps having to announce their closure in response. The loss of these apps not only deprived users of their preferred Reddit experience, but also underscored the broader implications of Reddit's shifting priorities. The decision to prioritize profitability over user experience was met with widespread condemnation, 
prompting thousands of subreddits to participate in a 48-hour blackout in protest. And also amidst all this turmoil, Reddit's official app also emerged as a polarizing hot piece of garbage that makes no sense to anybody. It's been criticized for its lackluster user experience, intrusive ads, and limited functionality, especially compared to some of its third-party peers. The official Reddit app failed to meet the expectations set by its third-party counterparts. Users lamented its resemblance to other algorithm-driven social media platforms, decrying its departure from Reddit's founding principles of community-driven content creation. Do you see where I'm going with this? Despite the mounting criticism, Reddit's response to the backlash fell short of addressing the underlying concern. While the company announced updates to its API terms during a CEO-hosted AMA, it offered little reassurance to developers grappling with the fallout. The promise of continued access for moderation tools and accessibility-focused apps failed to placate the broader developer community, who saw Reddit's actions as a betrayal of the collaborative spirit that once defined the platform itself. In retrospect, Reddit's handling of its API changes serves as a cautionary tale about the perils of prioritizing profit over community. By alienating the very developers who played a pivotal role in making Reddit portable, the company risked eroding the foundation. They didn't, they, they did. The company eroded the foundation upon which its success was built upon. As Reddit enters these turbulent and shady waters of monetization, it's gonna have to reckon with the consequences of its decisions. And I don't know if they can actually ever rebuild trust within its user base and developer community alike. I don't know, I don't think so personally. What did they try before doing this whole IPO thing? Reddit's dalliance with blockchain technology marked another controversial chapter in its journey towards IPO. In an attempt to diversify revenue streams, Reddit ventured into the realm of NFTs, non-fungible tokens, and selling digital assets to exclusive content and experiences. While NFT sales initially garnered attention and generated, you know, a lot of buzz and revenue, the venture ultimately proved to be very short-lived and unsustainable. Many of the NFTs sold during the peak of the height have just completely plummeted in value, and it left participants just completely disillusioned and questioning what the hell is reddit thinking furthermore there was a the whole community points initiative i mean do you even remember that that was not even that long ago this aimed to tokenize user engagement within specific communities and that met a very similar fate as well Despite early enthusiasm, the project itself just faltered, leaving users with worthless tokens and raising concerns about, once again, Reddit's ability to deliver on its promises. Amidst all these blockchain missteps, Reddit CEO Steve Huffman's leadership once again, once again, came under scrutiny. Huffman's decision-making, including the API price increase and mishandling of community relations, exacerbated tensions between the platform's leadership and its user base. He remarks comparing Reddit moderators to unlanded gentry, further highlighting the, the disconnect between Reddit's execs and its community of moderators, literally these people who work for free. These people play a crucial role in curating the content and maintaining some semblance of order on the platform. Do I think that they also get really high in their own supply? Yes, but you know what? At the same time, they do have important jobs. Also, adding fuel to this dumpster fire, Reddit's IPO deal included provisions which allowed key stakeholders like Sam Altman of the OpenAI fame to access Reddit's data for its AI training purposes. Altman's ties to Reddit, combined with his role as CEO of OpenAI, is raising concerns about the conflicts of interest and data privacy. Also add into that, that with Reddit doing its whole IPO thing, they're going to allow Google and Google's Gemini, I believe is the one, to use Reddit for its training data as well. 
Do you know how stupid that AI is going to be? And yeah, like it shows in the thumbnail, I actually did get an offer for the IPO. Apparently I was one of like 78,000 or something like that that actually got extended an offer. Yeah, no, I'm nope. I noped out of that so quick. It was what, $35 a share. It peaked at, when it opened, it peaked at like 54 or something like that. So yeah, you know what? If I want it, I could have made a nice quick profit, but that's, that's not how I do things. I'm... I'm not a gambler. But yeah, let's see what this IPO looks like by the time I'm ready for this video to go live. Well, it's already dipped so far, so <laughs> let's see. We'll keep an eye on it. So as we're all watching Reddit's journey to its, I guess, anticipated, much maligned, I don't know. As we, <laughs> as we all watch Reddit just IPO into the sunset, uh, I, it's really hard to not reflect on not only the trajectory of this singular platform, but also how this really affects the broader evolution of the internet as a whole. Uh, Reddit's ascent from a humble beginning to global prominence really mirrors the transformative arc of like digital culture as a whole. A journey that is always marked by innovation, controversy, and perhaps most notably, <laughs> the inevitable march towards capitalism and monetization. In its early years, Reddit really emerged as a bastion of, for the most part, pretty free expression and community-driven content. It, it was kind of just like this little digital corner where people could just share and explore a vast array of different topics and interests. If you were a very niche hobbyist or very passionate activist about a certain cause, there was more than likely a subreddit for you. Reddit offered a space where individuals from all walks of life could find camaraderie, support, and belonging. For many, myself included, Reddit was more than just a website. It was kind of like a virtual home. It was a place where friendships were forged, ideas were exchanged, and, and perspectives were challenged and expanded upon. Like I know for me, there are so many hobbies and there are so many just things that I wouldn't have gotten into if it wasn't for people on Reddit being like, yo, I'm really into this. This is really cool to me. I want to show it to you guys. And think about it like this. You know that meme that people make about looking up some very obscure software or tech support problem and you end up finding the answer from like a freaking 12 year old Reddit thread that has like two comments on it. That that was probably peak Reddit right there. That was the reason why so many people flocked to the site and why it had the reputation that it did is because of the fact that like, it didn't matter what weird thing you were trying to find. There was probably a couple other people trying to find the same thing too. Yet as Reddit grew in both scale and influence, it inevitably found itself grappling with the complexities of commercialization. This IPO represents a very pivotal moment in Reddit's history. It's a juncture where the platform's founding principles and community ethos collide with the extingencies of corporate ambition and stakeholder expectations. They are legally beholden to their stakeholders now. Think about that. If the line no go up, people lose their jobs. Think about that now. What are they going to do to make sure that line goes up? As Reddit now seeks to monetize its user base and court investor confidence, it really risks straying from the very values that endeared it to millions. The values of authenticity, inclusivity, and user empowerment. I, I wouldn't even say that it risks it. I, They've strayed, all right? They're catching all the strays. The challenges facing Reddit are very emblematic of broader trends reshaping the digital landscape right now. As the internet becomes increasingly commercialized and corporatized, we are witnessing the erosion of its once vibrant and idiosyncratic character. The enshittification of the internet, if you will. The rise of algorithmic feeds, targeted advertising, and data commodification 
threatens to homogenize online discourse and community, which really stifles diversity of thought and expression in the pursuit of the almighty profit. Moreover, Reddit's journey towards commercialization raises really profound questions about the future of online communities and the nature of digital citizenship in general. In an era marked by rampant disinformation, echo chambers, and algorithmic manipulation, the need for authentic community-driven spaces has never been more urgent. Reddit's ability to balance the imperatives of profitability with the demands of community stewardship will undoubtedly shape the course of its future, and by extension, the future of a good chunk of the internet itself, which sucks. I hate that. I hate this. As we're all watching this IPO unfold, we're pretty much confronted with a very sobering truth. Empires rise and empires fall. Digital ecosystems evolve, and no platform is immune to the currents of change. Yet amidst all this uncertainty and flux, there's at least like a little bit of a glimmer of hope. There's a recognition that the internet's true value lies not in its market capitalization or shareholder dividends, but its capacity to foster legitimate human connection, creativity, and collective empowerment. Even when, if Reddit falls, we should all try to make a commitment to preserving the essence of what made Reddit special in the first place. While I know it's hard, especially in today's economy, it's really important to try to resist the siren call of commercialization and capitalism in order to kind of reaffirm our commitment to authenticity, community, and free, th free expression. That, that's why I'm here. And I mean, to really just kind of wrap this all up, it's not the IPOs or the market valuations that define the internet's legacy. It's at the end of the day, it's really all the connections that we made, the communities that we built and the stories that we all help tell. That's, that's what is so great about the internet. Reddit be damn. So there we go. That, that is my whole retrospective on Reddit, where it came from, where it is now. And I guess why I'm not very optimistic about its future as much as it sucks to say. Yeah, I really want to know what other people think because obviously as weird as it is, this is a very important topic to me. 15 years on Reddit, Re my Reddit account is older than all of my children. Even before I met my wife, I had a Reddit account. So yeah, to say that this is a very big part of my life is very much an understatement. So I'm going to wrap this up. I'm going to start editing all this. There's so much that I didn't get into. I didn't even get into Aaron Schwartz and his impact. And to be quite frank, I wonder what he thinks about all this stuff now. I mm, nonplussed. Anyways, if this was all interesting to you, like le leave a comment. I want to get some other opinions on this. If you think that this is worth sharing to other communities and you know, to other old head Redditors like myself, go ahead and share it. If you want more over analytical content like this, you know, like, share, subscribe. I want to try to test something out now. Smash the like button. I think it should do something there. Uh, smash the subscribe button. It should do something there too. Anyways. All right, I want you guys to discuss amongst yourself. I want to get some feedback on this. 